Tom Gallardi began his career in the hospitality industry at 14 as a busboy in the restaurant of one of his family's Vancouver hotels. And he's worked in every area of the business since. After graduating from UBC, Tom joined the organization as a regional manager of the Sandman Hotel Group, becoming president of the group at 23. Three years later, he became president of the parent company, Northland Properties Corporation. The company is now the largest family-owned hospitality company in Canada, with a number of well-known brands in the hotel and restaurant sectors in Canada, the UK and the United States. And when he's not doing all of this, Tom is also the owner and governor of the WHL's Kamloops Blazers, the AHL's Texas Stars, and the Dallas Stars Hockey Club of the, NA of the NHL. Tom, thanks very much for joining us for Canada 360. My pleasure. Well, let's talk about how the recovery will look for your industry. Uh, we're in what economists call a K-shaped recovery where some sectors are doing well and others are struggling. The tourism, hospitality, and events sectors are at the bottom of that K and have been among the hardest hit sectors throughout the pandemic. It will likely be the, the last to recover. What has the last year been like for you, having to consistently reinvent the organization and adapt to ever-changing regulations? Well, it's been unimaginable. I mean, uh, you'd like to think that you, you've always, you know, got yourself in a position to be prepared for the worst thing that can happen to you. And, uh, you know, we've, as a company, decided to diversify geographically. We're, you know, we operate in five countries now and um, across uh, different uh, industries. Um, and, but unfortunately, we weren't smart enough to pick ones that were on the top part of the cake. And so, uh, you know, basically everything we operate is, uh, is on the wrong side of that. So it has been uh, the most challenging year of my career, uh, most challenging of, of our company's history, uh, without a doubt. And, and certainly it's what we've been hearing throughout the sector, that this has just been utterly unanticipated and it's been a, an extremely tough year. The government has, governments have, have brought in various programs designed to, to help. How have these programs worked for, for your businesses? Uh, for example, there were several programs that have provided direct support like the wage subsidy program, but there are other measures like the upcoming increase in the alcohol tax that are really feeding the fire. What programs have been the most helpful and, and what the least helpful to you? Well, SUS has been, um, the wage subsidy program has been uh, a godsend to the tourism industry. There, without a doubt, without that program, um, we would have had in, in my opinion, seven or eighty percent of the of the tourism industry completely shut down, and uh, you know what is shut down is probably less than half of that amount. Still significant, but less than half. So it is no question that SUS has saved jobs and kept businesses um, open, including ours, because we would have had to close a number of businesses. But we've been able to keep virtually all of our businesses operating in Canada, um, and SUS has been the number one reason why. Um, and so it's been it's been super helpful from that perspective. I, I we wish it would have been a smarter program, and uh, because it's been uh, it's been uh, you know used incorrectly, it's been and, and many people have benefited more than other people. And you know, unfortunately, the program isn't geared to things like margins, where you know you have different businesses that have been benefiting from getting uh, 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 wage subsidies but their margins are a lot larger and versus something like a restaurant where you're dealing on pennies on the dollar normally uh, in a profit case, you know, even Sue's alone isn't enough to, uh, it, to fix the industry. So while it's kept the stronger players open, it certainly hasn't fixed anything. And, um, and the SERS program that's been, uh, that's been uh, announced is, is really the missing piece of what we need as an industry, but unfortunately it's a prejudicial program uh, from the perspective that it's capped based on uh, on who you are. So if you're a big business, um, you really get limited uh, benefit. And if you're a small business, you get far more benefit. So it's geared against uh, companies like ours who, you know, employ thousands across the country. Yep. Your argument isn't that small businesses shouldn't be supported, but that you shouldn't be discriminated against. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll give you a really quick example of a parent. You know, in downtown Toronto, we operate a Moxie's restaurant, and and, um, and a and a you know a block away, there's an independent restaurant. Let's say we each employ 75 people. We each pay rent of thirty-five thousand dollars a month in taxes, 
and we're forced, both forced to close by a public health order. One gets uh, a $35,000 a month in surge support, and we get the equivalent of $3,000 because we're, we're way over 100 units across the country, for instance. And so one can pay their landlord and the other can't. Uh, and, you know, it really is meant that, you know, the bigger guy ends up having to close, their staff lose their jobs. An independent guy with one restaurant uh, is able to keep open and keep his staff working. So, you know, the question becomes, well, why, why, is, why, why the prejudice? Why are that guy's employees more important than the bigger company's employees? And so that's been super frustrating for us. And, you know, we've been, we've now spent the last three months lobbying every politician and anyone who listened to us, you know, form groups across the country to try to get our voices heard because it's not fair. Um, so, so literally you could have two restaurants beside each other with two servers being paid the same amount, same experience, both supporting families. One ends up having to be laid off because the, because the company doesn't have the support and the other is able to, to stay on. Um, how do you explain it's, that exactly. the laid off that, that they're discriminated against in this way? Well, you, you can't, there's no really, no real explanation for it. So it's really, a, it's, a, you know, what we, we believe is a political decision and it's prejudicial because of, uh, of, of our size and uh, people like us. And it's not like we're a big international company. We're not Starbucks. I mean, we're certainly large in Canadian scale, but uh, you know, we're not a worldwide, you know, organization here with, uh, you know, our, our shareholders are my family and, you know, we're all born and raised in British Columbia. Sounds like penalizing success, which is not the right way to go. Um, now, another factor that, that's affecting your sector is the automatic escalator and the alcohol tax. Parliament passed legislation that doesn't have to come back for review, where automatically each year the, the taxes on alcohol will be going up and where you're paying more for tax than you are for grapes and a glass of wine or uh, more for tax than for hops and a glass of beer. What's the impact on the business? Well, it's, it's devastating because um, ultimately we, you know, we just have to charge more to try to stay in business uh, to absorb the tax. And at some point, you know, if we, you know, continue with, um, you know, raising minimum wages and doing things of that nature, you know, the only choice we have as operators is to pass on uh, those expenses to try to stay in business. And so we become more expensive. And as we become more expensive, uh, we're less successful. Uh, obviously, there's only so much you can charge. And we're driving people to uh, to consume at home. And, uh, and so you have to ask yourself if that's good for employment in this country. And uh, so, you know, the, 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 at the end of the day, you raise our input costs we've got to raise our prices and then that just means we have we have fewer jobs for people and fewer businesses to open and, and we grow less I mean those are the results and so there's only so much you can charge and our taxes on on alcohol are among the highest in the world and one wonders why we have to keep raising them um, during the pandemic businesses have been reinventing themselves and many restaurants for example have moved to takeout when they were you know, sit down operations before or they've opened up stores within the restaurant. I've uh, been a number of other changes. It's tougher, I suppose, with hotels to reinvent yourself. You have to have actually have bodies in the room. Um, where have you been able to adapt and, and where has it been very difficult for you to do so? Well, the hotels, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do. Um, I mean, obviously, there's been some pandemic business. We've been been able to get a hold of with health authorities and uh, and quarantining, but unfortunately, it's been uh, you know it's been uh, a, a small a small piece of what's been lost. I mean, our our basically the Canadian lodging industry is is off about sixty to seventy percent you know since the pandemic's gone on, and you've seen large hotels close, occupancies in big city center center uh, centers in the single digits, totally unheard of, uh, and so you know lots of lost of employment, lots of damage. And in the hotel business is only so much you can do. I mean, we have, as a company, been focused for a while on reducing touch points, you know, technology, trying to become frictionless. Certainly since the pandemic, set, hit, pandemic has hit, we sped up our focus on that and, uh, you know, launched a, an industry leading program called Pure Clean across our businesses to, uh, you know, to, to make people feel safe and make rooms safe and make touch points safe. And so, that's been a massive effort from our, for our company to, to implement and, uh, and more than just saying it, you actually implement it. And so it's uh, been a huge commitment for us just to try to, to get that into, into position. And, uh, you know, our, 
our businesses have fa fared pretty well, given uh, the fact that we're national, our brand's pretty well known in Canada. And so we've been fortunate than a lot of other people uh, uh, in terms of uh, what's happened here. And so it's just been devastating and technology in the hotel business can only take you so far. And on the restaurant side, you know, the, the businesses that have takeout windows uh, and are really good at takeout and delivery and acceptable takeout and delivery businesses like pizza guys have fared pretty well during the pandemic. You know, unfortunately the sit down restaurant, the higher end restaurants, uh, we've all had to develop that. And so we've always been, you know, we've had sort of some delivery. It's been a really small piece of our business. And so while that's grown, the takeout and delivery piece of our business has grown, not enough to be, uh, you know, profitable and certainly not sustainable in the sit down restaurant. So it's been, uh, it's put a pretty dire thing. Uh, you know, the resorts, again, touch points, you know, how can we, you know, we have, we're in the ski business, we have trams, we have gondolas, we have, we can put half the people in we used to put in. So now we're reserving, you know, you, so online ways to reserve a place on a tram at this time. And so, because the space, space is precious. So yeah, technology, we've used it to the best we can, but in the resort business, we've used it to try to keep our capacity up to half of what we're normally able to do. So you can just imagine the impact on the business and the bottom line. So it's clear that for hospitality, this is a really tough time. Canada 360 wants to look to the business-led recovery. And what does that mean looking down the road? Uh, it's clear that we're going to lose many businesses in the hospitality sector in the short term. What does the longer term future look like to you? Sooner or later, this ends. Sooner or later, we come out of a very long, dark tunnel. What does the landscape look like for the hospitality sector? Does it have a future in Canada? And, and if so, uh, is it a place where, where you're looking to invest in the future? Well, assuming we can get past the pandemic and you know we're not dealing with variants a year from now, if that's the case, then all bets are off. But you know, assuming by sometime mid to late summer, we have 70 plus percent of the, of the country vaccinated and uh, people feel safe, our borders can get open. Uh, I mean, can you imagine that here we are now in February and the US Canadian border is still closed? Uh, we sat there in the summer, can't believe it was not going to open. And for sure in the fall, it's going to open. And here we are in February and there's no sign of it opening. So any bets of turnaround and, and, and recovery that we were talking about in 2020 are all out the window now, given the state of you know, our borders. And, and now we're facing uh, stiffer border restrictions uh, than we've ever had you know, uh, to date in this fight against the pandemic. So we're, we're a ways from being uh, good. You know, they're, they're, the optimism uh, is there on the leisure side when we get past the vaccine. As we know, Canadian saving rates have never been higher businesses uh, saving rates have never been higher. So there's a lot of, there's a big chunk of the business uh, uh, world in Canada that's actually in pretty good fiscal shape. And so there's optimism that that money is going to get spent in investment once, uh, once the pandemic clears. And we think leisure has a chance of recovering. Uh, the business travel, uh, which is a big chunk of the lodging business in the country is going to be sluggish, uh, I believe. And I, and uh, experts are, are saying it might be 2024 before we can get to 2019 levels of spend overall. So we see leisure coming back first. We see business travel coming back second. We see third, uh, third being, you know, the convention market is, is going to be the distant one. Uh, when are people going to congregate in convention centers in the thousands? And so, cause that's a big piece of business as well. And, and, uh, um, you know, I think that we've all ha all had our share of Zoom and Teams meetings, and uh, I think that uh, everybody knows the value of meeting face to face. I think the world is chomping to travel again. The world is chomping to uh, to to meet face to face, and it's awfully hard to build culture in a company on on Zoom. So it's going to be a rough time in the short term, but if we can make it across the river to the other shore, there's a brighter future over there. Yeah, I, we're, we're optimistic. I mean, we would have thought that the second half of 21 would be uh, the start of a recovery and we feel less strong about that now. So I think 21 is going to be a, a really tough year, you know, a start to finish in our industry. Uh, and, the, and, and we hopefully will get some, some, some tailwind here in the third quarter. Um, but that's, you know, there's different, differing views of that uh, on that now, but certainly we get this vaccine implemented it works against the variants for the most part. 
2022, we can start to grow out of it. But, you know, we're a long ways from where we were in 2019. And so um, it, it, it could be, it could may, may well be 2024 before we can get to that type of, uh, that type of uh, position again. Well, we'll all hope that that can happen earlier as opposed, as opposed to later. Tom, thanks so much for being with us today at Canada 360. It's my pleasure. Thank you.